Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike your host, and in this episode we chat to former South African Air Force pilot, Corbis Terrain. In part two, Corbis shares what it was like going from the Mirage F1 to the Cheetah, the role of the Cheetah in the Air Force, the upgrades the jet had, DACT, which includes going up against SU-30 and SU-32s, and we wrap up with some personal questions. So if you enjoy our content and would like to support the channel, you can do this by donating monthly at patreon.com forward slash aircrew interview. Thank you and enjoy. We're going to talk about the Cheetah now. So talk us through this aircraft and where this design came from, because it kind of looks like a Mirage 3 and a, is it a Kifar, Kifar a kind of like a mutation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think that all the secrecy about the cheetah is, is gone, so I don't think there's a, a problem talking about it. But at that time, you can imagine it was uh, the arms embargoes and things like that. So, but very quick, when did we realize that um, we were actually with the MiG 23s entering the Angolan War? The biggest thing they had was they had head-on capability with missiles, and um, also, then their the performance was just amazing. That aircraft is a, is a big performer. So we had to get something new. The idea was to take a lot of the F1 AZs. They had low hours. The CZs had many hours. They were closed down at the time. And then take these AZs um, and then convert them into a, a, a new type of aircraft with, with uh, enhanced electronics, enhanced missiles. And um, and that's all we had. But then, unfortunately, at the time, the, the war was still, the conflict was still, what you call it, the conflict. The conflict was still continuing, so they couldn't withdraw him because they did long, especially at night, low-level reconnaissance, not reconnaissance missions, but um, taking out some of the railway lines to prevent them there, Kubelai, prevent them from uh, bringing in ammunition, ammunition and, and hardware. Then they had to think hard, and we had the Cheetah E's, which is basically an old Mirage 3 converted into a Cheetah E. So the, the the bottom line was we had to look at something else. And then the Cheetah C's, the Cheetah E's were there, um, and the Cheetah D's, but the D's were, they were dual seater, so they, they were looking for a single seater. And a long story short, eventually it was, you know, we found the Kafirs, and the Kafirs were actually Mirage 3's, which were changed into what we want, but with a J79 Phantom in it. And the project rolled out, the Cheetah project, um, and we, I, I don't have all the details, but basically, they took a lot of these kafirs, changed it into what we call the Cheetah C, putting in the 9K50 of the F1s. So at least that we got back the 9K50, which we know. They put a whole electronic suite in the Cheetah C. They had to extend the nose to put all the electronics and things in with a lovely radar. Um, I think similar to an F16 almost. Um, so that the electronic suite, the suite, uh, everything was was does, uh, was actually started the. Uh, 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 what do you call it, um, state-of-the-art technology in the aircraft. <clears throat> in addition, we had full canards put on as well. And, and unfortunately, we didn't have slats and things, but that's still the Mirage 3. So it was a Mirage 3, it was a Kafir, it's now the TTC. And um, if you look at the aircraft, that's why it's quite confusing. But um, of course, when you know the aircraft, then you can see, well, that's that's a Kafir and this is that. But anyway, that that was our highly secret Cheetah C that we got in. It's a beautiful um uh, the modifications were beautiful, really. The, oh, fl- well, I forgot to mention, in-flight refueling, which was new to us. I mean, the AZ could do in-flight refueling. We couldn't. The CZ didn't have a probe because of the radar. I, I suppose it wasn't. And the, I know that the, the RZ in-flight refueling we didn't have on the CZ. So that was new to us. That's also a nice exercise. It can be scary at times to do in-flight refueling. And yeah, it was the Cheetah C, and it was beautiful. The, 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 <clears throat> yeah, you know, the, the technology in the cockpit was just amazing. The rest was old Mirage 3. Even the ejection seat was the old Mark 6, I think, Martin Baker, where in the Cheetah D, you had the Mark 10, Martin Baker. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fuel systems, hydraulics, everything was still the same. The electronics they had to, to um, soup up a bit to build the Cheetah seat. But, I mean, it was wonderful to see how, in a, what, what short a period of time, they could come up with a new fight. Unfortunately, well, unfortunately, for you understand what I mean, by the time this project was there, and I was asked to go to the squadron and take over from the project uh, officer who was also the commanding officer of the squadron to take over as, as the commanding officer and they gave me a project guide to run the project. Because that time the Mirage 3s, uh, the 3 Cs, they were also closed down. We were at Hootsbrecht, at 2 squadron, and then 2 squadron moved to Louis Trichon. It was what's called Makara today. And I'm not sure if those some of those Mirage 3 bodies were used as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, 
make a plan. You know, we always say we make a plan. And this is what it came. It wasn't cheap, for sure. Mm-hmm. And he had a brilliant new fighter. And performance-wise, obviously, with the Delta and Canals, you know, you have to be very careful. It's the 9K50, but the aircraft weight three times more with all the equipment. Uh, electronic warfare was, was very nice. I mean, the F1 had very basic electronic warfare. So that, that and it was called the Cheetah C. Yeah, so it, like all these upgrades, uh, did the cockpit get, uh, you know, kind of glass, you know, glass screens and everything to uh, assist you with that? Yes, yes, yes. It was it was still the initial type of glass cockpit, so the head-up display is big. There was also a one-piece windshield in the front, which was very nice. Um, and then you had your glass, uh, the glass displays. You didn't have three or four like we have today in the modern fighters. No, not at all. But you had your, your computer, your, your um, input you can do in the front. It had something that you, a data loader that you can plan your whole navigation, everything, then put in the nose, download, sort of stuff. That type of things was, was actually new, very new to us. And then you had your glass display with colors and, and all the modes. We had the, um, I think it's a Mirage 2000 like control stick. And uh, throttle, I think, was a Mirage 2001. Wow. Artas, hands on throttle and stick. So it had all these functions. You know, if you could play piano, I mean, that'll help a guitar. It'll help with all the functions. Now, to learn this, and now you're getting older, to learn all these functions and modes in the aircraft. And now it's a multi role aircraft because you can do everything on the same aircraft. And eventually, you also got a reconnaissance pot that you could put on. And there was a designated reconnaissance pilot that only did the development of the reconnaissance pot. But you had to be... Uh, uh, well, jack of all trades and a master of none. Mm-hmm. He had to be a master of all these different roles. So the, the beauty of the GTC, it could fulfill all the roles. Um, it doesn't matter what we have, LGB, uh, laser guided bombs, we have the normal bombs with a fancy computer you can press. And once everything goes up, you just follow the, the hut at all the reason its own time. Uh, even I could throw bombs. I mean, the aircraft would do it for you. Um, it had a chaff and flares, it had an active electronic warfare suit. Um, so it was, it was really a lovely platform to fly. And you know the Delta was very good for, for air to ground, especially at low level. Wish it was the F1, but again, you know, having said that, that Mirage 3 is so strong. And of course, the missiles were advanced. I think we had then the V3B, the Kukri, um, uh, luckily developed, then we had the V3C, which had a head on capability, um, infrared. And then we had the uh, F4, um, I must actually look at it, the V4, the Altum, it's an electromagnetic missile <clears throat> on the Cheetah. But unfortunately, this is all after 88, and the conflict ended in 88. Mm-hmm. You kind of no. mentioned a few there, but can you go into maybe, obviously the strengths were there, but a few of the weaknesses the aircraft had? The Cheetah or the F1? We're talking yeah, Cheetah. Cheetah now. Yeah, Cheetah, yeah. I think it was underpowered um, because of all the weight that was put in the aircraft. So not the aircraft's fault. It's a strong beast to fly. Of, obviously, if you do the pre-flight, you can see all the holes because it was a Mirage 3 and, and it, uh, then it had a J7-9 and now it's got a 9K50. But well, that wasn't the weakest. That, that aircraft was so strong. And I think it had the platform for uh, electronic warfare, uh, electromagnetic type of missiles um, with the EW suite. But the performance was, I think, was probably the only weakness. And we flew against the Sukhois with the Cheetahs. And, of course, um, the one thing that is nice, it's still a small aircraft. They just couldn't see it. But, you know, that radar is almost bigger than the aircraft. So it burns through your EW because your EW is only as powerful as the size that you've put in. Uh, but still, with tactics, you know, everything, you don't have a strength in something, you have to evolve your tactics with it. And even at that time, it was when the, the governments changed, we still were a little bit, uh, left on our own how to develop the tactics. But then we started it started opening up and we had the French and the Russians come with their aircraft and we could fly against them and measure some of the tactics. And only later on when we flew against the tornadoes and um, well they did not I the F fifteen, you know, we could evolve and, and measure our tactics. Although the Russians were very, very surprised when they got here and we showed them how we, we flew the tactics. We still had the Cheetah D which didn't have all this fancy stuff, but it could designate, for instance, for a laser guided bomb. But the Russians would flew with us in formation, so they were actually quite surprised that where, where did we get hold of all these um, fourth generation, I think it was, in uh, tactics. It's, it's reading, reading. There was a guy, Johnny Rasmus, he was brilliant with that. And we practiced all this stuff, and then what worked we used, because obviously you have to adapt to your own circumstances. And like I could say the biggest problem we had was just that thrust to turn, and maintain the turn, sustain, and high G, and then to get out of the fight quick. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, it was state of the art. Wish we could have used it. 
okay. in the type of conflict. But obviously, you don't want the conflict to test yourself. Of course, yeah. And we're going to get into DACT and uh, a bit more about that Russian, you know, when they, they brought their fighters over. But um, how did, what was the aircraft like to fly and how did it handle? It handled nicely. You can Mirage 3, it's like I handled like a Mirage 3, although it was a little bit more power. Uh, the 9K50 was easy to handle. That's also the big difference. The O9C is very susceptible if you open up quickly, and, and many times the, the engine will, will have a, a compression stall or something like that, where the 9K50 was really a beautiful engine. So we know the engine well. The flying was not much different to uh, the old, well, I only flew the EZ, the old Mirage Cs, except you had these canals, these big canals, and you can fly that thing at such a low speed. But you have to make sure that you stay on the right side of the drag curve, yeah. otherwise you have problems. Where you usually come and land with the Mirage 3s, the old ones at 180 to 190 knots, you can land this one if you have to, like a drag should fail or something, down to 165 knots. But you know, must know, again, you must fly that 165 and not 164.5, 165, <laughs> depending on the one. Yeah. Um, so I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. It was nice to fly. For air shows, um, it was not that nice, although the guys did give lovely air shows on it, but obviously it was a bit wider. There was a stage in 1995, I think, at uh, La Bougie that we, Danelle, built the Cheetah C, but one with a combat wing. And they wanted that aircraft to fly at the show. And uh, I said, well, I'd love to, but uh, Rick Culpin, he also passed away. He was a test pilot for Danelle. And he said to work, you know, they've got this box. And unfortunately, there's no way that in this box that we can stay in this. Um, so that aircraft did go there to to show the combat wing. Basically, it didn't have slats, but the, it was curved. We had a curved slat wow. area. Um, so, yeah, we couldn't do that. So, uh, But we did a lot of lovely displays with the Cheetah. It's such a strong aircraft. So now, now I've become the new trainer. And the guys would now evolve from um, flying Astros at Longabon. You know, and there wasn't the, the Impalas were taken out as well. And that was quite a big jump. You know, how do you get from there into the, the yeah. Cheetah? But they had the dual seaters, so fortunately that helped. And then you go and fly the, the sea. And, and the Delta Wing is a beauty, make no mistake. The Delta Wing is lovely, but you have to be very careful when you come below 200 or 250 knots. And could you feel, uh, was there much drag uh, having that extra bulk on that nose? Yes, um, especially the, the in-flight refueling probe, that caused a lot of drag. Um, all these antennas, protruding antennas and things for the EW, that, that, that had a lot of drag. And then because of the extra weight, you know, there was a plug in the nose. You'll see, yeah. if you look at it, you'll see that the aircraft is longer. Um, yeah, that had, a, had also an effect on, on the performance of the aircraft. But if you have to fly straight and level and get that missile off and go back home, no problem. But I mean, the other guy, <laughs> but that's not how it works. Okay. Um, so for the time that we have at the, the Cheetah D, actually, or the Cheetah, we, both Cheetahs, it was really a good phase to hand over the expertise we had to the youngsters. And now they're flying the Gripen and the Hawk, although they don't fly much. And at least we could move from the Cheetah to the Gripen, which is a, a totally different beast. Okay. There, there's no pro problem with yeah. performance with either the Hawk or the Gripen. Yeah. So let's talk about DACT. How did it fare against the other types? And also, yeah, talk us through a bit more of that, uh, that the Russians bring in. Was that the SU-32, did you say it was? Uh, obviously, those aircraft were so big, and, and the performance, you, you you know, you can't match. It's like, a, it's like a F-16. If you put an F-16 be, uh, in front of the, the Cheetah, it will take him a few, few seconds to be right behind you. But this is now when you do um, the, uh, initial training with them. Was it, before, it lacked that performance. But when you use your tactics and you use your um, EW and you use your missile ranges and stuff, it's a dangerous aircraft and you have to be careful. Um, this, the aircraft that we had there, and there's a lot of contentious issues about the photograph you have with it. It's a Sukhoi 30, the dual seater. And everyone said, no, 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 that's not a 30 because there, there was no 30. It, that was specifically designed for the um, arms deal uh, where they came for marketing in South Africa. And that was called the Sukhoi 30. And I was very fortunate to fly the front seat with Vika Pukachev in the back. And I was flying and he was flying against the Cheetahs. And in um, the, the biggest advantage with the Cheetah because it's so small. So once the problem with it, with it, it's that long range. And when you come across, when the guy gets off his missile first, he wants to fight. Yeah. I mean, that's usually happens. But if you can survive that, we can see him from far away. And you go down and you come up underneath his belly. Then he's got a problem. He's got this beautiful radar stuff, but I mean that overruns. Sometimes at closer ranges, that uh, it actually burns out our EW, it burns out our radar. That's how powerful it was. But there's always, you know, if you can get inside, 
but then you mustn't miss. Well, yeah, because its performance is amazing. But they struggle to pick up the aircraft because with that camouflage, you know, it's very really difficult when there's eyes. And you just don't see the aircraft. And that's the advantage we had, that we could see that huge, that huge, huge aircraft from quite far. The other one they had there was the Sukhoi 32, they called it, the single-seater. Now, the single-seater, that one had that camouflage. Uh, but it wasn't designed for actually the area and summer it will work well. Where Spot it was very similar to, to that aircraft in the sense of it's 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 not the real camouflage for uh, up in the air. Although yeah. Spot amazingly, you struggle to see that aircraft. When it's loud, you just don't see that aircraft. Really? Because they had white ends. Yeah, can you believe it? Wow. And that was one one of the, the when we were gonna paint that aircraft, the uh, Air Force Command Council said this is an operational aircraft, expensive one. It has to remain operational. I said, well, we're going to paint it differently, but we'll we'll do trance. And amazingly, we use it for air-to-air -air as well. But um, it's amazing how flying against these aircraft, and also the Mirage 2000, although the Mirage 2000, where they didn't have a, a military guy, Eric Gerard was here, he was a, a Dassault a test pilot, he enjoyed it so much, he just wants to do all the fighting. Now, obviously, the Mirage 2000 this is a step above the Cheetah in many aspects as performance goes. Um, as far as we can use the same missiles, um, then obviously the, the the game is on, but that can it will outperform us. The lovely, I flew in the front seat of the Mirage 2000-5, and it's like an F1. It's amazing because actually it, it's a super brother of the F1. The, even the the in flight, uh, your your control test and stuff, it's, it's the same. It does it much shorter, but it is beautiful, and and it's so nice to fly there. So all we lacked was something with performance, and for the lack. I think Martin explained to me, and he said the Russians always says you've got an air combat, you have acceleration performance times turning performance times sensors times to the power of three and times two weapons to the power of four. And that gives you. <laughs> right. But again, who do you put in the cockpit? How experienced is that? And we were very fortunate with very intense training uh, all these years and, and some um, combat uh, experience that, you know, we think that we did well in. in and how we portrayed our combat skills, even against flying the, the um, different uh, or dissimilar types. Um, when it came to the Tornados and the, I, the especially the 15s, and I, when they're talking big performance, and some other guys managed to pull it off. I mean, they, they, depending what the rules of the game is. I mean, the rules of the game is no rules. Then we have a problem. But then we have tactics. But once it comes down to, for instance, uh, the, the, we call it a gunfight only, which is every pilot's dream. In exercise, not in real oh, yeah. combat. And the guys did well. They fared well. I mean, even if 15 hours, how powerful that can disengage going up. But I think it was more the fun we had in, in, in learning and, and, and looking and testing your own tactics to see um, where we are with our own tactics. That was obviously the, it made it so worth a while for them to come and visit. And so too, also for the evening functions, of course, you can just imagine. Well, the Russians were a little bit more subdued, but once you get to the vodka, I mean, then there's oh, yeah. <laughs> that, no problem there. So it was such good exercise. And of course, remember, for years, the Russians were seen as the enemy. We fought against the equipment. And now all of a sudden you say, yeah, you see a, a super, and you just want to shoot it down. This is so ingrained in us, but it's amazing how a, a table stood and how, we got, how well we got along. Obviously, the English language was a bit of a problem. Um, the, uh, the the English language is uh, – you find the, the, the factory pilots are a bit more fluent in English, where the military guys are not really. Alexander, he understood my English because maybe I'm not English-speaking and I'm Afrikaans-speaking. So maybe there's – he understood more. He says, always, he will fly with me, fly with me. They actually offered me to fly the Sukhoi 32, the single seat. Wow. And I said, I, I won't say no, but it's not my call. And I went all the way up to Chief of the Air Force, and uh, he said, I know, I know you would love to fly the aircraft, and I would love you to fly the aircraft. But at that stage, you can imagine that the, on the diplomatic levels, I mean, yes, Russia and South Africa working together. I mean, today it's totally different. Then it wasn't. Imagine you lose the aircraft. And they also said, what if something goes wrong? And it speaks Russian to me. He says, no, no, you know, ejection seats. Very good, very good. You know? So I said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. But, yeah, as much as I would love to have done that, of course, uh, it, it didn't happen. And it's amazing how, in the end, you know, if you put a lot of a bunch of pilots together, we talk the same language, we're actually the same type of people. The only thing that's a difference is the badge on your on your epaulet or the aircraft you fly. Uh, similarly with the French, unfortunately, we're not the, um, although we worked a lot with the French 
you know, wouldn't work a lot of them, but we had some contact with the French Air Forces as, as well. Uh, Luigi Benciante, 1995, he came here with the Mirage 2000 at the beginning of the arms deal, but that was for that huge air show we had. I flew in the back seat with him. So I flew the Mirage 2000 in the back, the Mirage 2000-5 in the front, and the arms deal they were going to give us was a 2000-9, which we'd love to have. But obviously the arms deal didn't go about a single aircraft. It went about the full package from ships, submarines, tanks. Anyway, that's a long other story. So, yes, I think the, the joint fun we had, um, meeting other people, and because you now for years we've been isolated, yeah. and we didn't have the exchange, we didn't have to see where we are, what's our standard, what's our level. The Angolan conflict um, showed us what we have there is a match until we were outmatched, because our radars, we had to deploy them in there to have radar coverage, which they were really, they were always in green radar coverage most of the time. And of course, the, the head-on capability, the missile head-on capability, and then of course the 23 with its superior power performance. Mm -hmm. uh, still, you know, this when you go against a big guy and you have to, you you make a plan. Absolutely. Uh, and, and and by doing this uh, dissimilar training, you could see our, our plans were actually quite good. Yeah. And did uh, the cheetah have their helmet-mounted sight? I still have a picture here somewhere where at, at uh, some function I had that helmet on yeah. my head. And I said to you guys, what do you think of this? I said, I never want to fly with it because it was a bit crude and very heavy. Uh, it was used in, as far as I know, uh, only in projects. You know, they did projects with it and wear the helmet. How far it went, I'm not so sure because the projects were also kept quite quiet. But as far as I know, it was never used on a, on a squad. Not, not at one that I was flying anyway. Because that was designed with a cookery, the V3B, I think, and later with the V3Cs, which were our missiles. So it's a pity we couldn't test them, um, but they were, when flying against each other, we, at times we had the, the F1 AZs. They had the V3C on them. Mm -hmm. we, had, we still had our, um, we had, uh, we had the, the, the snakes, the V3S. And that's the time that the war came that you have to close the tower, you know, and, and cool your engine to turn. And actually, it evolved, you know, and eventually you're going to a fight. We have a 4v4 or something with these uh, electromagnetic missiles that you, you do this, you do that, and you escape. You don't know who's shot down. And afterwards, you have to come and look on the, the playbacks to see you got shot down. I said, yes, that's not, that's not my type of air combat. Yeah. But anyway, with the youngsters coming in, then we realized it's like automation, you know, their skills were lacking. So we went through the Ultra C Squadron. Today, we start with 1v1 cannons only. Oh, by the way, I only have one bullet. <laughs> yeah, it enhances the skills again. Of course, and that's yeah. why training was, was so good. And we were very good with the cannons because we, we exercised and exercised. And as the and you know today, I mean, it's, it's they have to have the red flags and that. It is so, they can put a lot of aircraft there. But, you know, your biggest problem is flying to your own guys. Mm. Uh, and you don't know who was shot. You can see aircraft explodes. And, and um, that was behind my time. And I, but I think I'm still a gun type of combat guy brilliant so do you have a memorable story you can share with our viewers from flying the cheetah Whoa, uh, well, i'm sure you some... have loads but uh, maybe a few yeah, that's a bit brought me unaware there i was just trying to find i think the most memorable is maybe not the, the nicest one we um we used to do it a few it, it uh, sometimes we would go out and do um air combat 2v2s and then we refuel and we carry on with the fight and this particular day um, and why I remember it was my scariest moment, I think, in the cheetah, is that we um, the fight was evolving very nicely. And I can remember the names of the guys who I was flying with. And but it was it was um, and the, the, sorry, just one thing. I'll, I'll come back to this um, very quick. Another thing, obviously, that was good with us is the commentary and control, because we 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 flew so much with F one Cs against F one Cs. And F1As, it doesn't look different from distance. Mm -hmm. And then we also fly the Cheetah Cs versus the Cheetah Cs. And in that fight, you never know who's who. And through that, it actually upped our, our level of commentary control. So that day, we had two uh, Cheetah Cs fighting another two Cheetah Cs. And I was busy tracking a guy. And then my, my wingman shouted, there's somebody behind you. We were already low. And I looked back. And by looking back, you just move the stick slightly to the right. And it went into a flat spin. Yes, and this was on the Hotik, which is 12,000 feet. The ground below the mountain is about 5,000 feet. And the problem was we had a, the belly tanks on, the center tanks, and that doesn't help much for directional control. But from what I recall is from, from uh, um, Isha flying, is you push her nose forward, try and get her to stop. She didn't want to stop initially. And once she stopped, open the afterburner and wait for 300 knots, 350 preferably, and do nothing until that. 
and then put up. Otherwise, you're just going to stall the aircraft all the time. And I could see the mountains go down, and I could see going up and see the mountains go up behind me. And the guys were shouting. So the ejection thought never came through to my mind. It was just too busy. And a few years later, um, Des Barker, our test, chief test pilot, he also passed away this, this year. Um, he came and he said, look, come and have a look here. And we never actually realized that. The, it, it would turn and stop. And usually like a leaf does that. You know, it just turns around a mean direction. It didn't. It was turning the world around. So actually that teacher was in a spin, a full spin. Although it was a flat spin, I said, okay, I'm not feeling any better at the moment. <laughs> I said, well, you can because you, you survived it. And, um, and I'll never forget that most probably that, that center line tank. And that's where years of experience just comes in and helps you, especially with, with um, airshow flying. You realize is that, that the performance is key and performance comes from the engine. Mm. Um, if there's something I enjoy, the rest, of course, with all the nice air shows we did and the fly pass we did with the Cheetahs. Um, and I spent five years on the aircraft and that was such a wonderful time. Mm. And that was, um, I think I left in 1999 and went to the airline. So if I there's one that's standing out at the moment, it's it's that one, and I still get we call it a little bit of <laughs> uh, because um, you don't realize sometimes how close you are by by not making. Of course, also at that time ejection wouldn't have helped because it's an old Mach C uh, six seat, it's a zero zero seat, but you still have that rate of descent, and even a flat spot go down quite fast. So there's so many memories. Um, there was such a beauty to fly. Absolutely. Um, so how many hours did you get in the cheetah total? Uh, uh, 800 hours. Wow. I had 1,200 on the F1, um, and uh, there was a combination of 80 hours on the on the training with the Mirage 3s, and then 1,100, 1,200 on the F1Cs, and then uh, 800 on the Cheetahs. So there are, uh, there are a few of us that can say we've got 2,000 hours on supersonics. You're lucky, man. Which is, <laughs> yeah, I'm just flying. I've got anywhere about 4,000, 4,600 hours on Air Force flying. The rest are all, obviously, airline flying. So to wrap up this interview, we've got a couple of questions from our patrons, if you're happy to answer them, Corvus. Of course, if I can. Right. So the first one is from Noel, and it is, let me find it here. Can you describe the ra radar set in the Cheetah and whether this radar allowed for BVR engagements? Uh, yes, uh, the radar was practically an HPG-68, I think, which was close to the F-16 Type 1. So we had BVR engagements, a lot of them, because uh, obviously you have the display, you can designate which target you want. So the full display, and you have hot ass. So if it answers Noel's question, uh, yes, I mean, it could do. The Cheetah C could. Um, unfortunately, we had the old Sirena 4 on the F1, which obviously it couldn't do that. And you can select your targets. I mean, it's a multi-role um, radar as well, which you can use in air to ground modes and even update your system for navigations. But it was lovely. It was really so nice. And then with the missile, um, also gives you the keys in where you can fire, especially when, when you fire from this angle. And it will tell you that no, it won't hack, the missile won't hack. So the radar was so advanced and it was something new to us. Um, and I think the whole, the whole um, Cheetah C project was built around the radar. Yeah. How they had yeah. the, or the, 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 um, the old Delta frame to work with. But I mean, for the rest, it was all built around that radar. Absolutely. And the second one from Noel is, um, is it true that the Cheetahs had some had computers for some fly-by-wire flight controls? No. Um, I know there was talk about having some fly-by-wire, but uh, no, we never had fly-by-wire on the Cheetah. Mm -hmm. Well, would love to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, hopefully that answered your questions there, Noel. And this one is from Brett. Was the 707 tanker used for aerial refueling during the conflict? Or did they just rely on their wing tanks only? No, the the, the 707 at the time was used in Eland, um, uh, rolls only, and then transport rolls. And I must now really think hard at what time did they become uh, tankers. But no, as far as I can recall, uh, they were not, we didn't have them in tanker rolls uh, during the conflict. So it ended in 88, and I think it was soon afterwards that uh, we started having the Boeing in in the uh, in flight refueling mode. So they had the three, the three stations. Um, that's a good question, Brett. I'll have to go and look it up. But certainly, I, I don't know, and I have to ask the AZ guys maybe if they had, because they're the only ones that could do refueling. 
but I'm I'm quite pretty sure that um, we didn't have that that function. Otherwise, we could have stayed in the air yeah. much and go much deeper and further, which we didn't. Mm-hmm. So, but Eland, yes, you know, um, for that uh, I know it was used for that as well, and then also transportation. And the second one from Brett, I heard Israel helped with ACM skills in exchange to fight against our F ones. No, never. <laughs> everything is over everything is open yes um a lot of times and we had quite a lot of inputs you know there's there's nobody as skilled as somebody that's that's brought up in war your your training is in actual war and they went from war to war and still from war to war and we had very good bonds there were the five paramilitary states during the time of the arms embargo and obviously they were one of the major uh, ones to support us ironically we, we could never go and fly there with them but we had some of the guys come to fly with us, and they flew with us. They flew with, um, not the Impalas, but they flew with the AZs. Um, and also not that many, if it's four or five in a period of five or six years. That's, uh, so we didn't have an exchange program, we, we, which we did have with the Chileans, for instance. The guys would come and fly in, and, and our guys would come and fly there, and the Taiwanese. Um, but they they came to us, and also, you know, they didn't send their youngsters. Only the later phase with the cheetah, we had a, a guy as well that came out. He was one of the youngsters, but obviously very, very operational. But some of the senior guys came out, and they actually showed us how to uh, advance our tactics in, in, in ways that we never actually thought. They, they're masters of, of air combat, obviously. Mm. Um, their motto is uh, no alternative. And uh, so, yes, Brent, yeah. Uh, we weren't allowed to talk about it for many, many years. But yes, they were here. We were good friends. We, you know, we shared so many um, good stories together. And obviously, um, during the wars, um, conflicts, we, we always read about the Six Day War, and you read about these wars. And some of these guys could come and tell the stories as well. Well, thanks for answering our patrons' questions there. So I've got a few uh, personal questions to wrap up here, Corbis. So, do yeah. you have any hobbies? Yes, flying and flying and flying. Never. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my hobby is basically a uh, water sport. I uh, love sailing. Um, until recently, I still had my hobby 16, then a, f- a tree at the dam fell in it. Um, water skiing is, is also good fun. The rest is all, yeah, it's building aircraft models. That's, um, I just don't have enough time at the moment. Can you imagine? Now you're retired and you think you have all the time. Yeah. I always uh, go to work to rest, and now I don't ever work. Now I'm not resting because I have to keep up with contract work, especially in safety. Another, I can say it's actually a working hobby. So I got involved in, in, in um, airline, not airline, but uh, general aviation safety and human factors. And that's keep me going at the moment. And it became a hobby. It, it's actually a working hobby. Mm-hmm. And for the rest, what else is there that I enjoy? Yeah, now that I'm getting older, gardening is, is I suppose that's a hobby as well. It is. And uh, otherwise, well, everything flying. The only flying I do at the moment is I'm going to fly with my son. He's a flying instructor, a 400 hour flying instructor, going to fly with him. I did a lot of flying when we had to build ours. Nice. And a friend of mine, like Martin Fence, has got an RV8 to go and fly with him. Just go and pull a bit of G. And uh, I'd love to if I could, because it's become so expensive, you know, to have your own oh, aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, aviation remains a big hobby, and then the human factors became the others. Um, the skiing at the moment, my kids do the skiing. So, being on the boat on the water to me is, is um, if not in the air, on the water, please. I pretty much think that's it, yeah. So, favorite aircraft you have flown? F1. F1, <laughs> oh, F1. Right. Oh, yes. And and what I did enjoy, the Mirage 2000 as well. I only flew the Rafale in the Comet Simulator in La Bougie, which is a beauty. I mean, the Rafale to me is just a lovely aircraft. But as as much as I say the F1 sees it, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed everything I flew. The Harvard, the Impala, and also the Cheetah, of course, uh, because I, I spent many years on the Cheetah as well. But if you park everything here and you say, pick one, I said, okay, all of them. <laughs> so I don't think it's our favorite. A lot of people, the questions ask, which one would you prefer? Now I will ask you, what do you want me to do with the aircraft? You know, if it's an air show, I'll take the F1. If it's now an air combat, I will take the Cheetah C because of the assistance it has. Mm-hmm. But I think I've got a soft spot for the, the, the F1. It's the one I flew most, so maybe that's also. And then also, of course, later in, in, in transport flying, I mean, more types can, which is the Airbus um, 340-330s and also the Boeing 738s. Great. So I can and add to my list. Mm. I think I know the answer to this one, but one you would love to fly. Rafa. Yeah. Yes. 
Look, um, they, they say that look, you look at the F-35s, you look at those, they're such advanced fighters, you know. But one thing that Dasa always said, if she looks good, she flies good. And that Rafal to me is just, that's my, that's my apathy of a fighter aircraft is a Rafal. And I was said during that air show as well, so got the Pernock, forgot the pilot's name, says, and remember, it's not only the Rafal, it is the marine version, you know, the, the, the marine, the gray one that's used for, uh, on the flight ships. Uh, but yeah, I would love to. I, 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 I had the privilege to fly the, uh, the simulator, the Comet simulator. But yeah, that's not, that's not the Rafale itself. But that mm. cockpit layout, everything, it's just you're sitting it, it still smells like a mirage as well. It's amazing. Mm. So to wrap up, I'm going to ask you, because I've noticed it throughout the interview, your Tornado F3 print in the back, on the back wall there. How did that become, you know, part of your pictures there? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give you a short, quick rundown. But the F3 was, uh, I flew with Bill Farragut. A long story short is I was at uh, Ludwig Hart and, and, he, and he finally was looking for Spugarity. Because Spook was a good friend of his, and Al Thoros was at 11th Squadron, or we call him Thoros, he was at 11th Squadron in uh, Air Force Base Nimi, and he wanted to know to come and visit Lou Trichard to come and fly against the Cheetahs. And I said, Well, Spook is closer to you, he was the air to show then in Israel. I said, Okay, but then, and I said, Maybe if it's, if it's a tornado, you want to speak with Jan Mini, he says, uh, I see uh, Squadron Commander of the F 1 AZ, the mud movers we call them, the air to ground attack. He says, No, no, we're not, we're not the GR ones, we're the F 1s. I said, You want to come here? I said, What's the question? And um, then uh, there was uh, the major, I think I mentioned that uh, Royal Air Force, I can't remember that there was a, a Royal Air Force fighter seminar or something. And we, as I say, in South Africa, was invited. We were invited to go there. And I still went with the late Rick Culpin, who was the test pilot at Danelle. And um, he flew the, the, the Cheetah uh, with a combat wing. And because I was the OC of the squadron. And then it was, we got the permission to, to actually open up Here's the Cheetah Sea, which was held, so, we was kept so secret. Of course, we didn't use many other, I mean, where does it come from exactly? But the bottom line, uh, Thoreau said he'll be there as well. And then he invites me to come and visit Air Force Base Leaming. I said, he's a flip in the equation. He says, what's the question? <laughs> of course. And I was so fortunate. And I went with the attache, Stein Fenter. He, he drove me up there and with Rick Alpen, And we went to um, Leaming and we passed a little town called Rugby. And little did I know, this is where rugby comes from. I mean, that's my favorite sport, which is our hobby as well as watching sport. And that's how I ended up in the backseat of the, 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 the tornado. Lovely. It was so nice. It is feeling like the same. You sit in the back, unfortunately, and you do touch and goes. You know, you can't see much. It's this bathtub that you sit in, which the Tito D in the back is not much different. But the, those two little engines, it's amazing. We accelerated over the um, over the sea um, from 300 to 600 knots. And I didn't think that aircraft can do that that quick. <laughs> and, of course, and then, of course, you've got the swing wing. It's another wonderful thing. Clunk, 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 clunk. I'll never forget it. <laughs> I was very fortunate. Well, you've had an absolutely amazing career, Corbis, but I want to thank you very much for coming on, on the show and sharing your story. So thanks very much. Oh, Mike, I appreciate it. I'm really privileged. I mean, there's so many, many other fighter guys here in our country, but um, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I hope I could tell you something you didn't know or... Yeah, Just that's a lot today. That's for sure. Aircraft. Thanks so much. We'll stay in touch and in the bed the book I'll let you know as well. Yeah, absolutely, Corbis. Thanks again. Cheers. Thank you, Mike, and all the best. <laughs> <laughs>